events are ramping up. The world is coming to wild delusion. And we are in a time of war, possibly a time of complete and utter madness. We'll see. Guys, stay tuned because we're going to be talking about some things that I've never seen before. It's got me super interested. I would say uh, scared, but I'm I'm kind of more anticipating. But I think that it's possible that things will not get better. They will only get worse. And I know a lot of people dream and think that things are always going to get better and that the white knight's going to come in and take things to a new level. But inevitably, these wars, these collisions between these religious groups have happened for thousands of years and we're at a breaking point so stay tuned tonight guys we'll be right back and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up rise up rise up Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Midnight Ride. I am excited to welcome each and every one of you once again into the Puritan Barn and into the Now You See TV studios for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, we're going to be talking about something that is of imminent importance. We're going to be looking at what the Word of God and non, excuse me, and non-canonical Bible text. I just lost my voice. Excuse me. Let me get a drink here. Oh, it's got you choked up. This subject does, doesn't it? <laughs> got you it does. Up. Something does here. I need to grease my gizzards. Yeah. Excuse me. But <laughs> grease your gizzard. But anyway, we're going to be looking at what the Word of God and several non canonical texts say about our random Bible prophecy. Last week, we did a broadcast about the non canonical books and how the book of Enoch and second Esther's talk about how they are going to show us things that are going to help us during the time of the tribulation. Nothing could be more important than for us to understand the role of Iran in Bible prophecy. So get ready. It all starts right now because we're now live, live, live. What's up guys. We are live from the Puritan barn. And I couldn't be happier to be here. I feel like I'm living in some sort of dream sometimes when I wake up and I realize kind of what's going on in the in, in the world. I rarely look at the news, but when there are events that seem that they could trigger a motion of events that will trigger Armageddon or the end of times or wherever we may be at in Bible prophecy, I pay attention because even though a lot of what we see is going to be theater in some respects, there is an underlying truth behind what they're preparing us for in the future. And so I'm super excited to talk about this tonight. So please, guys, let us know where you're from in the chat. We'd love to hear it. And David, how, how has your week been? It has been very good. We're just very blessed and uh, with everything the Lord's doing. Just very, very thankful. Just having a great time serving the Lord. That's awesome, man. And, and man, that greasing your gizzard, I really... I really love that. That's a, you've got to make a shirt or something that yeah. says, I'm greasing and grease your gizzard. It's time for the midnight ride. <laughs> I, I like it. I've never heard that one. I've heard a lot of different ones, but never grease your gizzard. I'm, I'm going to have to remember that one. Keep that in, in there for a, for Keep a good it time. Close at hand. Close at hand. And uh, for those of you that are preparing for Passover coming up, some of you celebrated last month, and there's different dates we don't care about that necessarily because i don't feel like i really know 100 percent which dates correct but for those of you that will be celebrating passover tomorrow happy passover hopefully it'll be an enjoyable one for you guys and something that you can reflect and and really uh look upon the um, look upon god and his redemption through it so i celebrated it last month i'm gonna celebrate it yeah. this month yeah man we're gonna have so a good time yeah tomorrow. i uh you know 
love Passover. Love Passover. Very good, guys. So with that being said, uh, we are going to be right back, guys. Stay tuned after a word from our sponsors. Mainstream companies put dangerous chemicals in their products that contribute to disease and disability. This is why it's so important that we take care in the products that we consume. The skin is the largest organ in your body and it is the covering to your temple. Our sponsor tonight is Sugar and Spice Soap Company. They create all natural and biblically clean soaps and beauty products. They even have a soap for Midnight Ride listeners. Use coupon code NYSTV to receive 10% off all your purchases. Link in the description. If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. All right, guys, thank you for checking that out. If there's anything you see there that interests you, check out the link below. NYSTV.org also has our Book of Enoch video commentary, and I'm going to release a bunch of them here soon because me and David have actually been consistently recording uh, weekly on these uh, episodes. So we're getting to the end of the Book of Enoch here very soon. So make sure you check that out. Uh, David's leading us from Gen or from Genesis, from the beginning, Book of Enoch, chapter one, all the way through. How many chapters is in the Book of Enoch, David? One hundred and six or one hundred and eight. Let me look. I just happen to have mine right here. One hundred and eight. One hundred and eight chapters. Yeah, one hundred and eight. And we're on chapter eighty four. Eighty nine. Eighty nine. That's right. Eighty nine. Yeah, we got through. Chapter 89 is the largest chapter in the book of Enoch, 74 verses, and we made it to about the first 27 or so. Yeah. So we'll probably finish up 89, our next setting, and we're, we're getting there. We're under 20, so we're, we're moving real good, and it's exciting. It'll be really a, a sense of accomplishment to be able to go through it. That's not something a lot of people can say they've done to teach through the entire book of Enoch verse by verse. Yeah. And it's been a blessing. Yeah. It's been a blessing. Hopefully we can finish it before Armageddon. That's the, that's yeah. the hope, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> but anyways, guys, also, if you're looking for any kind of gear, uh, whether it be hats, t-shirts, mugs, go to trutherfit.com. The link is in the description. And there, I believe there is a code for you to get half off of the midnight ride mugs that has they're, they're really neat so go check it out guys and also david let us know what you guys have going on uh over at fojc tomorrow night on sunday night live brian reese and i were going to be doing a presentation entitled pressing into the kingdom of god it's going to be based upon a couple revival sermons one by jonathan edwards and the other by thomas watson and it is really it's it's timely and it's needful very good. Looking forward to it as always. And so, guys, um, buckle up, hit the subscribe button if you have not. And if you're just waiting to see that if it's going to be worth it or not, I guarantee you that if you stay to the end, money back guarantee, you will want to subscribe to this video. So let's get started. Are you ready to get started, David? Yes, sir. All right. So we're going to start by kind of just we're going to be discussing this topic because I think that we are in a time that is like none other that I've seen. And of course, I'm only 41 years old. I know a lot of people think that's very old. And then there's a lot of people that think that's very young. So it just depends on where you're at. And I know David, some people would consider him old, but I consider him uh, a friend, you know, not too old, not ancient, that ancient, but he has pleasantly never seen mature, pleasantly mature. That's a, that's a great way to put it right there. Pleasantly mature. <laughs> and he has never seen a time like what we're experiencing now because we have a lot of things that are coming together at the same time 
that make this really unique. I mean, we have the escalation of war. We have this age-old Israel-Iran war that has been escalating for a very long time. Um, we're right now at a precipice, and we're going to talk about that and where we're at in that. And also prophecy-wise, uh, David is going to go through and show us exactly where Iran is in Bible prophecy, as he's been doing for many times. I think 2019 is the first time that I did a show with David on that subject. David led us through that topic, and so we're going to talk about that and look into that, because this is actually coming to fruition right in front of our face. It's just amazing uh, the way we see it. And we have an escalation of paranormal activity that is going on all over the world as well. We even see national governments uh, telling us that these things exist, telling us that these things are real. And we are starting to see some of these things ourselves, reputable people coming up with testimonies of encountering supernatural, weird, paranormal phenomenon and beings that we have not, at least not existed in the minds of most people until recently. And then we have the red heifer sacrifice, which we're going to talk about tonight. The red heifer is uh, a sacrifice that's eight, you know, thousands of years old, and we're going to discuss that, what it means. Um, we're going to be discussing Iran's war on Israel. We're going to be discussing the divisions over religion and politics that have reached a tipping point in the country. And we're going to be talking about the moral depravity and destruction and activity. We're actually not going to be talking about those things, but all of those things combined make up what we're going to be talking about tonight. So, um, David, did you have anything you wanted to add before we check out a few things to kind of give people who aren't maybe paying attention kind of the um, timeline where we're at on in at least what the news is showing us, what the theater is showing us? You go right ahead. Let's try it. All right, let's check this out. So uh, this is a video by WION. And I enjoy watching a variety, when I'm looking into a subject, I like watching a variety of different outlets. And I, there's sometimes that I like them. They they seem to have a more balanced uh, thing on the issue. They're not necessarily pro-Israel. They're not necessarily pro-Iran. They are, I think, more pro-Indian than anything. So India also has an agenda and all of this. So keep that in mind because I believe India and um and Iran have had kind of had odds for quite a while. And I remember seeing videos of this going on. This, uh, some of these videos, like the next video I'm going to show you after this one is, um, a year old. So anyways, let's check this out. This is Abol Fazl Amui. He, in fact, is the spokesperson for Iran's National Security and Foreign Policy Committee. Amui recently said, and I'm quoting now, we will confront any Israeli aggression and respond to it. We are ready to use weapons that we have not used before. The question is, what are these weapons? Is Iran hinting at weapons of mass destruction? And could Iran be referring to nuclear weapons? But then Iran insists it has none. Also that it has no plans to make one. But then again, there are facts that Iran cannot deny. And the fact is that Iran has been ramping up its production of highly enriched uranium for a while now. But between 2019 and February this year, Iran increased its amount of enriched uranium from 997 kgs to 5,525 kgs. Uranium that is enriched up to 60% is considered near weapon grade, by the way. In December 2023, the IAEA, or the International Atomic Energy Agency, had said Iran had enriched uranium to up to 60% purity. The UN body added that Iran has enough enriched uranium to build three atomic bombs. Let me repeat that for you. Iran has enough enriched uranium to build three atomic bombs. That is what the IAEA is claiming. And as I speak, Iran's stock of 60% enriched uranium has gone from 88 kg to 123 kg in one year. We are looking at a 38% increase. And observers believe that Iran is sitting on the threshold of nuclear weapons. They believe that Iran can produce enough weapon-grade uranium for a single bomb in less than a week. Iran can also produce enough uranium for five to six bombs in less than a month. What about the bomb itself? 
Less than six months is the timeline experts believe that Iran needs to make a nuclear bomb. But you know what? There is no way of knowing when that timeline starts. No one is ever building a nuclear bomb publicly, least of all Iran, which was once tightly bound by a nuclear accord, remember? The infamous JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Iran, remember, entered into this agreement with the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and Germany under it. Iran was allowed to enrich uranium for its energy use, but there were restrictions placed on the use of its nuclear facilities. And in return, Iran was given a relief from international sanctions. Six years ago, then US President Donald Trump pulled America out of the deal. And today, JCPOA is all but dead. And all eyes are now on this particular Iranian establishment. For the fuel enrichment plant. It is one of Iran's three nuclear enrichment plants, one of the others being Natanz in Iran's central Isfahan province. Fardo is heavily protected. It's a heavily protected facility on the edge of Iran's great salt desert. It was reportedly designed as a secret factory. And nuclear inspectors believe activities here hint at worrying possibilities. Western observers, in fact, say Iran has all it needs to build a bomb. But then again, you must take all of this with a pinch of salt. They are Western observers, like I said. You see, Iran's nuclear program dates back to the 1980s. And while Iran on paper does not have a nuclear weapon yet, it has, without doubt, often used its nuclear program as a leverage against the West. Now, could Iran be doing the same now as it tries to deter Israel from an attack? Or does it really have a secret weapon that it is not afraid to use against Israel? In the past, Israel has pledged to prevent Iran from making a bomb. Israel's spy agency has also allegedly assassinated Iran's nuclear scientists. So could these rising tensions between the two countries be a turning point for Iran's nuclear program? Could it throw West Asia into a nuclear arms race? Or could it start a chain reaction far more lethal and dangerous? On Sunday, Iran stopped inspectors from entering its many nuclear facilities. Tehran cited security concerns. And as I speak, Iran has temporarily closed its nuclear facilities. What's going on inside these facilities, though? That is anybody's guess. So there, there is, this was a couple days ago. This was actually before Israel struck back at Iran. At least that's what they're claiming. All the reports that I could see, it looks like Iran's going back to normal. Not much was destroyed. Most things were either shot out of the sky, maybe a couple places. Of course, I don't know. These are, this is all propaganda. Mostly you guys understand that. We know that there may, none of this may be true what they're telling us, but we do know that Iran uh, and Israel have been at war be together. We may not understand the agenda behind it. We may not understand the proper truth stories behind it, but the fact remains is uh, this is what we're being told about it. This is the, um, the only information that we that are in the West or we that are not on the ground truly understand about this issue. And as much as some people may hate Israel, they may hate the Jews, they may hate Iran, they may hate whatever. The fact remains that this is the center of our earth. This is where God chose to have his dwelling place is in this land. And so it's really important to look at this and see what we're happening because this kicks off uh, so many events that um, it, it's just amazing. David, what, what are your comments to that? Well, there's a little different flavor to this latest um, conflict we see here. And the, to begin with, we had the uh, invasion of the terrorist invasion the, into Israel, and Israel was totally unprepared for it. And I don't think anybody with a rational mind is going to believe that Israeli intelligence didn't know that border there is the most watched border. They have the best intelligence agency yeah. on earth. And Netanyahu had to finally admit that they did know about it, but didn't take it serious. Right. All right. Yeah. Then 
We have Iran that was a 3,000 missiles Iran shot in. Oh, my, we had one person injured. Then, and you know, the other night as we were getting ready to tape the Book of Enoch, I thought, well, this might be something. And there was uh, reports of uh, uh, missiles being fired. And then we have reports of the airspace shutting down. Well, it's missiles. No, it's airplanes. Yeah. No, it's three drones. Yeah. Nothing hurt. I think they blew up a chicken shack. Yeah. What's this all about? Yeah. $90 billion. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Ramping up. The globalists want to bankrupt our nation. And I tell you what, $90 billion can be split up a lot of ways. Mm. And we're already saying, well, we're going to give, uh, we're going to give the Gaza. We're going to give to Israel. We're going to give to Taiwan. We're going to give to Ukraine. Yeah. You know, that's the goal yeah. to push the narrative to where, uh, they're going to push this through Congress. They want to bankrupt America. And I, we said in a broadcast, uh, a few years ago that we believe there's a good chance there's going to be some double cross here. And I tell you, they're, they're playing together and they're, there's just so many, uh, dirty deeds going on here. And I look for America to double cross the Muslim nations. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. It's going to be a setup, a double cross. But I tell you what, it's hard to tell who's on first, but the, but the main bottom line here motivating this scenario is $90 billion. That's the motivating, motivating factor here in my mind. Yeah, it's interesting what, you know, the narrative that we've seen, we see there's three countries that kind of have come together, and we've talked about this before too. I think you talked about it in the Dragons of Arabia video that you did on the midnight ride but we there's this alliance being formed between three very key countries now we've been downplayed how powerful and how um historically mighty these nations can be especially if they were to come together uh i think you know just by looking at it geographically it seems that one of the only things maybe even that's close to holding them back is maybe the presence of turkey but um who knows you know they've got a massive military presence and if they are being um maybe the the I, the start of gog and magog this could be something that is really important to see so i i got this video and david's gonna tie all this in scripturally for you guys but i got this video that i want you to see from one year ago um but this has been something that's been in the making we talked about how that they formed an alliance, a several billion dollar alliance because of because of their oil, Russia and Iran did. This was, I think it was in 2020 when that actually happened, 2020 or 2021, when they formed their alliance. And we've seen that China has also taken interest in this. And this video will kind of give a little bit more of that. We're not going to watch the whole video, uh, but we're going to watch just the relevant parts to this video. Anything, David? Yeah, and I remember we were doing a midnight ride on Tartaria, and we were talking about the chapter in Second Estrus about the dragons from Arabia. Yeah. And we made the statement that this is showing us an alliance between yeah. China and Iran. Yeah. It was uncanny. Yeah. Literally, I think less than 24 hours after we said that, yeah. this was announced. Yeah, right after that. It yeah. was really uncanny. It was like, wow, Yeah. look at that. And once again, uh, this story that I, we're going to show, this is more um, is from Gravitas, from um, the channel that we just saw just a minute ago. And so their view is a little bit different than the American narrative, but pretty darn close. This is uh, people are starting to look, the, the NATO and all of these the people are starting to look at this at this time and think, whoa, man, this is a, a dangerous thing. And, of course, we know that historically most of you, that have, um, well, I wouldn't say most of you, because I don't know how many people you guys are listening that are new tonight, but historically, um, this, the only country that was mighty enough at one time to really compare to the, to the United States that we can remember, or that we can know of is the USSR before it fell. This was a mighty huge country. Of course, they killed off millions of those people. Uh, but these countries have been building in the background. We've we've seen them building in their education. We've seen them building in their numbers militarily. We've seen that they've hungered because, look, we've lived in good times. And when a nation lives in good times for a very long time, they become weak because they've been comfortable. And these people have not been comfortable. They've had 
a really rough go at it and they've had their education has increased their um, national money has increased you know whereas america's has faltered and like david said we have a two-front funding going on right now we're going to be funding israel we're going to be funding ukraine and um, iran's also funding proxies all over the world so a lot of this Bible prophecy is going to come together and show you exactly what's going on to kind of clarify it. Now, there's so many stories. As I said, there's so many stories, but there's a truth behind all of this that we're going to clarify. But let's watch this video real here, right here, and we'll. this is very short. ...about a new alliance, one that should not surprise you, but it should concern you, especially if you are watching us from India or the West. Why? Because the members of this new alliance are one, China, two, Iran, and three, Moscow. We are calling this alliance CHIM. We took the liberty of naming this alliance because we are convinced that its members will never name their relationship. Forget that. They won't even acknowledge the alliance. But that's where we come in. Gravitas tells you stories which others won't. And tonight we will tell you about this new strategic map that is being drawn. This new strategic triangle. There are three big stories coming in from CHIM. One, China is looking to triple its nuclear warheads. I repeat, triple. Two, China is building a railway line extremely close to the Indian border. The line connects Tibet to Xinjiang. It is also China's road to Gwadar. That brings me to development number three. Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi, is visiting China tomorrow the 14th of February. This Valentine's Day, China and Iran are shoring up ties. What do countries separated by continents have to gain by coming together? And why do we think that CHIM or China, Iran and Moscow are coming closer? Let's start by answering the latter first. Here are some recent developments. In September, Iran signed a memorandum to join the SCO or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization a body which often criticized as being nothing more than a talk shop for both China and Russia. And Iran is now its member. In November, the top Russian security officials visited Iran. Who were these officials? For one, Russia's national security chief and Russia's Security Council secretary, Nikolai Patrushev, a man who is extremely close to none other than the Russian president, Vladimir Putin himself. So why would Russia... So this kind of, you know, these videos are up for anybody to see, but this is, this kind of shows this path that's being taken. And interestingly, well, I mean, it's no surprise to me by now, of course, after this many years, but the Bible tells us exactly what we're witnessing at this moment. And David, you did a broadcast and I just talked about that called the willful king. In the book of Daniel and um, this broadcast was in 2019 of June 23rd so we're talking five years ago that you did this video almost five years ago almost pretty close to five years yeah and so you've been talking about this for a while and and to see it a lot of people actually gave you flack over some of the stuff you said about it because every people wanted to propagate Iran which is weird yeah. to me because I know yeah. Iran has gone through a lot of really horrifying things for the citizens there but the things that you said um are are coming true and because it's in the bible so tell tell us a little actually tell us a lot about iran and bible prophecy this is something that i want to hand over to you for a minute so that we can get okay. uh, a full scope of this because uh, there's a lot of people here tonight specifically to hear about this and and also the red heifer but this is very important that people understand what we might be seeing because when you can see what's happening i think that it it dampens the fear at least a little bit to be able to know what's coming at least in, at least for me it does i like to see what's coming if i can flip the light switch on down a creepy hallway i prefer that you know rather yeah. than not so yeah and it definitely dates me but i believe i've been teaching this for almost 30 years and wow. the longer i live the more real and the more confirmation that comes and in daniel 11 is where we read of the willful king and it talks about the king of the south and the king of the north and 
this insightful young lady talked about the Chim, the China, Russia, and the Iran alliance. And basically, we see here the uniting of the kingdom of Tartaria. We see Tartaria ran from the area there of the Ukraine all the way to the sea there into Chinese Tartaria. And we're seeing uh, not long ago, Vladimir Putin went to Xi Jinping and said, I embrace your vision for the new world order. And Putin basically kissed the ring of Xi Jinping and inaugurated him as the king of the South. Yeah. And in geopolitics, you can look up, uh, they talk about the global north, which is basically your G7 nations, and the global south, which is basically your third world countries. And this is Daniel 11. We have the king of the north, which is your G7 countries, Britain, the United States, then you have the global south, and no doubt Xi Jinping is the king of the south. And we see this prophetically coming into this end-time conflict. And for many, many, many years, I have been saying that the king of the south is uh, Iran, and it, it really seems to be the case. Now, we we had when we did uh, our midnight ride on Tartaria, right on the eve of the announcement of this chim of the Chinese and the Iranian alliance, we had three confirming witnesses. We had Daniel 11, and we also had the book of Enoch. In the book of Enoch, in chapter 56, and the fifth verse, and it says, In those days the angels shall return and hurled themselves to the east upon the Parthians and Medes. Now, the Parthians, this is in Iran. They're the Iranians today. They shall stir up the kings so that a spirit of rest shall come upon them, and they shall rouse from their thrones that they may break forth lions from their lairs and as hungry wolves among their flock, and they shall go up and tread underfoot the land of his elect ones. Mm. Specifically prophesying that these Parthians, Iran, is going to come into Israel in the last days. You want to know something? One of the slogans that they're saying in Iran is something about biting the tail of the lion, and <laughs> which is crazy. Ooh. And as we know as well, Iran also is where we get the word Aryan, right? Or Aryan comes from, Iran comes from Aryan. And Aryan is like Aries, the lion. Aries, Aryan has the lion symbolism, which we've talked about before too, because at one time, King Og of Bashan was the ruler of the Aryan kingdoms. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And we, we've got another confirming witness in 2nd Estrus 15. And if any, and I tell you what, last week's midnight ride was very good, even if me and John did do it. It was a <laughs> real good. We, we give you a lot of insight there into these uh, Jewish apocalyptic books, which the, the midnight ride tonight shows how important they are. Let's have another confirming witness from 2nd Estrus. And let's look at the 15th chapter, and we'll read... Uh, in verse 29, when the nations of the dragons of Arabia, well, I wonder who the dragon might be. And this is specifically uh, stated to be coming from the east. Pretty definitive. It says, they shall come out with many chariots, and the multitude of them shall be carried as the wind upon the earth, that all they which hear them may fear and tremble. Also, the Carmanians raging in wrath shall go forth as the wild boars of the wood, and with great power shall they come and join in battle with them. So here we see the Carmanians joining with the dragons of the east, coming from the east, and they shall lay waste a portion of the land of the Assyrians. Now, in the, in the height of the Assyrian Empire, it took over the whole area of the Levant there. Now, who are these Carminians? I'll read the footnote here uh, in the Oxford Annotated Bible. It says the Carmonians from Carmania, Kerman, the southern province of the Parthian Empire, Cha-Ching, the Carmonians in the second estrus, 
and the the Parthians in the book of Second Asterisk, they're the same people. It's Iran. Well, let's have another confirming witness. And this is one that I've never talked about before. I just discovered this this week. I have two new confirmations to this that we didn't have uh, in 2019 or in the last time we did our, our Tartaria broadcast. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the War Scroll, it talks about the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Now, in the 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 war scrolls from the caves of Qumran, it says that the leaders of the sons of darkness will be an entity they call the king of Kittim, another name for Assyria and this land of the Assyrian Empire at its height, which took in the entire Levant. I'll, Levant. I'll read just a little bit here. Uh, this is on page 189 of the Giza Verms edition. And in the the book I referenced quite a bit last week, The Method and Message of Jewish Apocalyptic, it put me onto this because it said that the War Scrolls was a commentary on Daniel 11. I thought, oh boy, here we go. Here we go. Interesting. It says, the prince of the congregation, which was written about in the book of Ezekiel the prophet, I will strike your bow from your left hand and will make your arrows drop from your right. On the mountains of Israel you shall fall. The king of the Kittim, the prince of the congregation, will pursue them as far as the great sea. And it talks right in Daniel 11. We'll read it. How that it talks here in in second estrus and enoch and now on this source and daniel 11 how this willful king is going to go right up to the sea it's it's a it's a quadruple confirmation here david i got a question what does it say about the arrows in there say that again okay and uh it says here and here it it begins quoting uh, ezekiel 38 and 39 then it goes to daniel 11 it says uh, the prince of the congregation and all Israel, which was written in the book of Ezekiel the prophet, I will strike your bow from your left hand and will make your arrows drop from your right hand. On the mountains of Israel you shall fall. So we're talking about the arrows flying through the air type thing. That kind of does, we're in Jeremiah 39. I don't know if you've got that verse. Yes, You're going to talk about it, but it talks about the bow, breaking the bow in that area as well, exactly where you're talking about in, um, I'll have to remember here, let me look here, in Elam, which yep. is territorially the exact same spot. So Same place. Same place. All three names for the same place. Interesting. And it goes on in the War Scrolls. It says, the king of the Kittim, the prince of the congregation, will pursue them as far as the great sea, and they shall flee from before Israel. In that time, he shall stand against them, and they shall be stirred against them. The same word, it talks about stirring them up in Enoch. Same, it, the, the language is so similar in all exactly. of these. And they shall return to the dry land in that time, and they shall bring him, the king of Kittim, before the prince of the congregation. The branch of David will kill him by strokes and by wounds, and a priest of renown will command the slain of the Kittim. Hmm. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. It is just absolutely fascinating. And in if I and it's a you can read that entire chapter uh, in the book of Enoch, and it talks about how that they go all the way to the sea and right up to the Temple Mount. Then something happens and they're driven out. And we see the same scenario in the War Scrolls. We see it in Second Estrus, and uh, I'll give you the chapter. It's Enoch. Chapter fixed 56. Now, is this all a coincidence? Well, I, I, you know, what I believe about coincidences. And in the 49th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, which John referenced, and this is really profound, and in all of these passages, the sequence is on the very final battle. Yeah, it's going to be Messiah come back and waste this guy. And it, it puts it at the very end of time in the final war like in the war scroll of Qumran of the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness yeah now Jeremiah 49 now we don't want to miss this and the the young lady 
from the Indian News Network actually showed a picture of this. The nuclear facility, one of their major ones, that is just almost on top of the ancient palace of Sushan, which we read about in the book of Esther. And it says here in Jeremiah 49, beginning in verse 36, And upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. Now, remember how Revelation 7 starts out. Four angels holding back the four winds of heaven until the, the sealed of God have the seal put on their forehead. We're talking about the removal of the restrainer in Enoch chapter 56. It talks about the release of the fallen angels. And when they're released, they're going to stir up Iran. You know, we, we've just got it all here. So it's going to be the four winds that will from heaven and will scatter them toward all those winds and there shall be no nation whither the outcast of Elam shall come. They're going to get smoked. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that that seek their life and I will bring evil upon them even my fierce anger saith the Lord and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them and there you go. And this is uh you know, when Israel, if Israel would, and uh, they will at one point in time, declare war on Iran, this would be one of their top three targets right here, I guarantee you. And it's right there. Um, you know, it's kind of an in-your-face type thing. Another thing, in the, uh, in the book, uh, The Method and Message of Jewish Apocalypse, Elliptic by Mr. Russell, he give another confirming passage, and this was from something that we keep talking about. It keeps coming up from another one of these apocalyptic books, Second Baruch. It talks about the black waters, and we see in the book of Baruch, it divides the great tribulation uh, into 12 parts. Uh, if you're preterist, just skip it and forget about it. Uh, if uh, it goes on and it talks about these 12 waters, black and white, they alternate. And in the final black water, this is what it says about it. And it talks about this final battle and this conf uh, conflagration. It says uh, in chapter 70, here, therefore, the interpretation of the last black waters. In verse 7, and some of them shall be destroyed by their own. And that's what I'm looking for, double cross. Then the most high peoples whom he has prepared before, and they shall come and make war with the leaders that shall then be left. And it shall come to pass that whoever gets safe out of the war shall die in the earthquake, and whoever gets safe out of the earthquake shall be burned by the fire, and whoever gets safe out of the fire shall be destroyed by the famine. And it shall come to pass that whoever of the victors and the vanquished gets safe out of and escapes all these things aforesaid will be delivered into the hands of my servant, the Messiah, for all the earth shall to fire its inhabitants. Wow. And second Baruch, just like the war scrolls, it sees the Messiah doing the, the final smackdown on, on this group of individuals. Now, when we put it to the, the primary Bible text is in the book of Daniel. And let's turn and let's read in the book of Daniel. And there are things here, there is so much cognitive dissonance among people when they read Scripture. When they read the Word of God, they can't really hear what the Bible's saying. They're going, they're going to hear what their favorite preacher said about it. And there's some things here in Daniel 11 that are just right in our face. Now, and as I said, Daniel 11 is the chapter. It talks about the King of the North, King of the South, which is exactly this final alliance. And this is exactly the way this final confrontation, the two sides are being identified as the global North and the global South. Well, let's read a little text here uh, in uh, Daniel chapter 11. And let's start here. Um, in verse 37, let's just read verse 37, a little text here. This is concerning, well, in verse 36, 
and the king shall do according to his will. That's why I'm very clever. I called him the willful king because he does according to his will. Now, 100 out of 100 dispensational Bible teachers are going to tell you that this is the first beast of Revelation 13. I'm going to show you that's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. And let's just read. It goes on and says uh, in verse 38, But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Yeah, and at that time, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, hello, Jijing, and ag come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall also enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, this would be the modern country of Jordan. And this guy, you know, we're not describing a world ruler here. We're describing a guy that's going to invade Israel, and he's not even going to be able to take even all of the Levant. He's not going to be able to touch the what would be the modern nation of Jordan. In verse 42, it says, He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver. Now, that's one you want to watch. And, well, I could go on a big rant how the, the dollar's going south and know how all the globalists, they're buying the gold and silver. Yeah, that's right. And it says, This willful king will have power over the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his step. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. And that word tabernacle there, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it means a really, really nice portable tent. Like these sultans you see in the movies that they have these really elaborate tents that are nicer in a lot of houses. But it says he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. He's going to go right to the temple mount. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. He is going to get smacked down. He's going to go into Israel. He's going to tear him up. He's going to go right up to the Temple Mount. He's going to, and quite possibly, set up a some kind of a portable tent there. Who knows? But uh, don't look for the Dome of the Rock to go anywhere. I'll just give you a, a tip on that. But he's going to come into his end. He dies right here. Now, look at 12 and 1. And at that time, that shows us timing. At the time the willful king dies, shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the people of thy people, for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. The great tribulation begins after this guy dies. He can't be the first beast of Revelation 13. It's clear as day. All we have to do is read our Bibles, but yet over and over and over, Daniel 11 is totally misrepresented. And what the, uh, the, um, the preterists say, oh, it's all fulfilled, don't worry, it ain't going to happen. And the pre-tribbers say, well, don't worry, it ain't going to happen till after the rapture when that beast is revealed. But what we want to understand, it's happening right now. Daniel 11 is straight ahead, it's in her face. These things are unmistakable earmarks. They're, they're just unmistakable signals to us that this is the truth. And more and more confirmation comes all the time. I am, I'm, I'm as convinced about this as I am about anything. There's too much confirmation here. It's interesting, too. There's so many proxies that Iran has been working with up to this point. I think almost all of the wars that are being fought, whether the, there's little military sects in 
um, Syria or whether they're in Palestine, they are all proxy military groups funded by Iran. And what's crazy, you talked about them gathering the gold and silver. They have so much money they've paid, uh, according to, this is according to one guy that was on a show, uh, Sean Ryan show, he was talking about how they pay people to come over them in Saudi Arabia. A couple of people pay people that are here in the United States and help fund mosques and do all these yeah. different things well, here. So yeah. we have, and, and just in the last year, not to fear monger, but we've had millions of military age men coming other, over from foreign countries that could very well be part of these proxies. We have an election coming up when historically when elections come up, at least in the last few years, there has been an uprise in um, violent incidents, at least within our own borders. And all, a lot of this stuff, you know, I think that could set off a chain of events, not just there, uh, because the United States is mentioned in their rhetoric, too, as being an enemy. And I could see um, the possibility of violence erupting, uh, maybe even worldwide, but at least possibly in the United States as well. What do you think about that? Well, absolutely. And where'd they get the money from? Thank you, Barack Obama. Yeah. And way back when they had the nuclear treaty, and I can't remember the figure, someone in the chat probably knows, a crazy amount of money that the United States paid Iran to sign that nuclear treaty. The yeah. minute Trump got in, he, yeah. he broke the whole thing. Yeah. But I mean, they had a crazy amount of money. And this is such a fact that, you know, something like, um, you see these mosques being built and they're really big, nice buildings and they don't have that many people in them. Yeah. Well, these are being bankrolled and they're being bankrolled right from Saudi Arabia. And of course, you know, we could go on and on. We have uh, Mr. Obama bringing in the the refugees from Sudan into Minnesota. And now we've got Mullah Umar up there as representative. And, it, you know, there's a plan to this. Yeah. There's a plan. The plan is destroy america destroy america take it down like babylon without firing a shot and this is just another big step bankrupt america 90 billion dollars oh if we don't you know one thing about it all of these wars if america would quit paying for all of them we might have a few less wars that's my that's my silly idea here yeah if they want to kill each other let them pay for it themselves mm. It's, it's one of those things that when you look at it from a perspective of somebody who's trying to make sense of everything, it doesn't make sense. No. Really, there's nothing on paper that will lead you to be like, oh, I get why this is happening. I get why we're spending billions of dollars on this country when our country is, is really just going to dumps and, and how much debt we're in. I mean, if I ran my household in the same way our country runs its pocketbook. If I run our pocketbook, my, my family's pocketbook, in the same way that our country is running the pocketbook, and then I, I, let's say I'm in debt for you know whatever amount of money and I only make not even half of that money uh, already, I'm already not making it, then I decide to go and help David. I'm going to send uh, you know $10,000 to you, David. Instead of paying my own debts, instead of taking care of my own house, I'm going to send you 10000 so you can get a brand new rifle or whatever you know i like it just doesn't make sense financially to anybody that has a head on their shoulders and one can only imagine what the real motive behind it all is i mean i could sit here and think about what is actually going on or say it even but it doesn't mean that um i know for a fact but it looks a certain way i don't think these guys are stupid so if they're not stupid there must be another reason behind all of this and and I think we all know, but it's just amazing that people are looking at this thing and they're truly waiting for some kind of theater uh, presentation. It's almost like a WCW event yeah. for people. But when the bodies start hitting the floor and people start seeing blood for the first time, they start seeing people that they know brutally murdered, um, I think it's going to start sinking in that this is, it is theater, but it's very violent and bloody theater at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. And the reason I say theater is because it's all been written before, right here in the scriptures. It's been written. It's been, it's the, the script has been written, and it's being acted out right in front of our face. We got the left-hand path, and here again, we go back to uh, the book of Enoch. We got the left, uh, or second asterisk, excuse me, with the two heads of the eagle in the middle, the right head eating the left. Yep. And we've got um, the left-hand path in America 
and the right-hand path. They'll fight like cats and dogs, but they all want the final agenda. They all, they all want to have that final new world order, but they're going to fight like cats and dogs over who runs it. Yeah. And it's a minute. And I'll just say this because uh, I, I just got to, but you know, here we got the supposed MAGA Republicans, and they're going to hold the line on this spending bill. Bless their hearts. Now, who comes along and comes up with the idea? Well, let's give it to Mr. Zelensky. We'll make it a loan. Yeah. Lindsey Graham and Donald Trump. Then they bring uh, the Speaker Johnson down and, well, we'll make it a loan. Like, they're ever going to pay back a dime yeah. of it? Really? Yeah. You know, like uh, when they're when they're tired of uh, shooting their cannons off, they're going to think about us good old Americans and write us a check. Got to be kidding. <laughs> Got to be kidding. Yeah. So yeah. Trump carried the ball across the line for him. Yeah. And, and not only was it written about in the scripture that this is going to happen, there's also a letter from Albert Pike to Mazzini. For some of you guys have heard this letter before. It was in uh, London uh, Museum for a very long time. Some say it's still there. Um, and this is the letter. I just want to show you guys this because it foretells the first two world wars that have already happened. They, they hadn't happened at the time. But then it tells the Third World War that we are actually experiencing. This is what the I believe this is what is going to getting ready to take place, and um, this is what we're seeing in the Bible. So here we go. Check this out. And First World War, he says, must be brought about in order to permit the Illuminati to overthrow the power of the Czars in Russia. And this was the uh, Prince Michael. Michael, uh, what was the names of these people? I can't remember right now. Um, these were the the palace they had in St. Petersburg. They had this beautiful palace. The Romanovs. The Romanovs, the Romanovs had these beautiful palaces, and uh, some people believed that this was the end of Tartaria. They, some people believed that these kingships that were um, such predominant at the time when the communists came in and took that over this was world war one this is when we saw the bolsheviks we saw a lot of different stuff what else can we say about world war one david i know you weren't uh, around during that but what else can we say and how um accurate this is about world war one well it's absolutely accurate this was the rise of the bolshevik revolution and it was also the beginning of the balfour the declaration which began to uh, paved the way for the nation of Israel to become a state. So this is ac absolutely spot on. There ain't no doubt about it that this happened. And this letter was definitely in the the British Museum. And I've got I've got a lot of confirmation on this. And I have one of the the books I have is by a Roman Catholic cardinal from Argentina that talked about going there. This book was written before it was taken out, and he goes there and talks about this letter. Wow. And um, yeah, and now it's been taken off display. I wonder why. But yeah, a lot, many, many people read this and confirmed that it was there. It most definitely was. All right. So the Second World War, we have uh, the talk. Everybody knows about World War II. I'm just going to read this to you because it's interesting the way it's worded here. It said it must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences between the fascist and the political Zionists. This war must be brought about so that Nazism is destroyed and that the political Zionism be strong enough to institute a sovereign state of Israel in Palestine. During the Second World War, international communism must become strong enough in order to balance Christendom, which would be then restrained and held in check until the time when we would need it for the final social cataclysm. Now let's go on to number three here. This is where we are at as we speak right now. Uh, the Third World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences between the agentur of the Illuminati, between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam, the Muslim Arabic world, and political Zionism, the state of Israel, mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on this ish issue, will become constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economical exhaustion. We're seeing that right now. We shall unleash the nihilist, 
the atheist and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism origin of savagery and of the most bloody turmoil then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with christianity whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction anxious for an idea but without knowing where to render its adoration will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of lucifer brought finally out in public view this manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. So we see this agenda not only laying out the last war, but what they expect to come out of this war. And we've seen through uh, the Scottish Rite their, their motto, Ordo, uh, Order Out of Chaos. We see that there are occult teachings that speak on this Hegelian dialect where you can have two sides opposing each other as David was talking about the right-handed path and the left-handed path we see this uh, agenda unleashed on to America and other countries David just talk a little bit about this statement here and how huge that this uh, agenda has been played out that we can see all right and I'll try to walk softly here yeah walk softly <laughs> um, We've got people that get offended and well, hurt by and things. Well, and this is, I guarantee it's going to offend people. There's no doubt that the establishment of Israel in 1948 was a prophetic event. It's, a, it's something that God allowed or it wouldn't have happened. But at the same time, when you read here the, the verbiage of Mr. Pike and Mr. Mazzini, Mazzini, who took over the Illuminati after Adam Weishoff, you can see that the creation of Israel was the plan of the Illuminati. It was, uh, we could say a lot about the Rothschild in, involvement in it, but the nation of Israel was created and Zionism, we, we talked about C.I. Schofield and how he was financed, this guy that wasn't even paying child support, he was belonged to one of the elite clubs there in New York where Many, many millionaire and billionaire Jews went that financed C.I. Schofield. Why would they do that? We talked about the Tavistock uh, Foundation funding dispensationalism and the pre-trib position. Why? Because Zionism will be the flashpoint of the final war. Zionism has to exist for this hatred to continue between the Zionist and the Muslim people. They're both being used as pawns in the game. Mm -hmm. And for the Israel of God, uh, and you know, I'm not here saying this evening that it's right. Israel has a right to have a country. They have a right to defend themselves. And uh, I'm not saying anything like that, you know, that they, they don't. But we have to realize that they are not the nation of God just because of their genetics. Yeah. And this is a creation to use as a flashpoint for the final conflict, which we've talked about in all of these scriptures tonight and these other confirmations. Right here it is. You know, they, they tell you their plan right there. And, uh, you know, it might be good for us to believe that they mean what they say. And you can see these first two world wars just as planned. And you can see World War Three here, according to the Illuminati plan, it's coming off without a hitch. It's so true. And David, um, it is an hour. We've been an hour, and I'm not halfway through some of the stuff that I wanted to bring up. So I'm going to ask you, first off, since you're here and we're live right now, do you want to continue this show? And then I'm going to ask the audience, Do you, would you like us to continue? Because this could mean another 30 minutes to an hour. So, David, I want to ask you first, since you, you kind of have the, the say since you're here. Well, I say let's, let's cap it here. And, let, and like I say, there's so much here. 
we can talk about uh, to come back and talk about next week the red heifer and let's why don't we see i just bet there's some people in the chat that might have some questions let's maybe take a couple questions yeah. and then pick it up and do finish it up next week what do you think i i, I think i think i'm in agreement because i do have and it could take more than an hour the rest of what i presented i i usually try to keep our shows in a certain period of time because i know that after a certain period of time it does become um hard for both of me and david because after a certain period of time you're not going to get much out of us after after that so you know we, we go two hours i could be starting <laughs> some new doctrines or something yeah but I, and in all honesty we present a tremendous amount of documentation layered spiritual truths and it's hard to maintain an, an intensity of focus not only in teaching it but also in receiving it. Yeah. So I think it might be good to just take a breath, reflect on this. I know a lot of people say, well, we listened to that two or three times and mm -hmm. I can understand why. So let's just take a breath and let's just see what's on the mind of the folks in the chat. Cause I know this is uh, in these times, uh, you know, people were, it's an uneasiness and like the other night, right before we recorded Dean, I goes, well, is this it? You know, are we going to, uh, are the, the taters going to roll here? And it didn't, but one of these days, the taters are going to roll. The taters are indeed going to roll. And, yes, and I, they are. And I have to say that, um, I, I am thankful to be able to present this. And, uh, we were going to speak on the red heifer, which I'll just give you guys a, a little insight into what we're going to be talking about next week when me and David come back and speak on these subjects. But, uh, the red heifer sacrifice, something that has started in Numbers 19. You can read about it there, about the sacrifice, about how the ashes were intended to purify uh, the people. And this hasn't been done for thousands of years. This is actually the last time, according to what I've read, the last time it was done was when Herod's temple was built. There's a lot building up to this. There's many different words on this. I don't think it's going to happen on Passover because it's not a normal sacrifice that they would do and so they wouldn't do that on the Sabbath I don't think it's gonna happen I think we have time before they're gonna do it to be able to do this show I think that it's important they're gonna do it correctly and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people and uh, there's some very powerful people that would love for nothing more than for a temple to be built right there on that mound and then there's people that would do anything including possibly shoot missiles towards a site in order to keep that from happening or maybe even march in to the temple mound and set up camp what do you, what do you think david i think that's the teaser right yeah. there yeah. I, I mean this this thing unpacks in all kinds of different directions and uh tune in next week and we'll go full meal deal on the red heifer all right, so I'm going to ask this question because I see it. First one I see popping up, the chat's moving so fast, it's making my head spin. Um, Gloria says, what about praying for Jerusalem, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, which we are commanded to do? What do you think about that, David? It's biblical, and I was talking about this Friday night. Yes, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And the average person in Israel is much like the average person in America or the average person in Russia they don't give a dee doodle doodle about all these geopolitical moves for control. You know, the the average Jewish person uh, isn't uh, into all kinds of evil. Uh, you know, they're victims and they're pawns in the game, you know, just like we are. And God has a remnant in Israel today. And we read in the book of Zechariah how that one third are going to come through the fire. We've talked about this a, a lot of times. So absolutely, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem because one day Lord Jesus is going to return and he's going to gather us back there. His foot's going to hit the Mount of Olives and split that rascal right down the middle. That's right, man. And I and I and me for one, I'm just looking. I'm just on looking. I see so many horrible things going on in the world to so many innocent people. Thankfully, we've we've been we've been blessed where we're at. We, yes. We've been super blessed, and and we've had nothing but we we almost live in a slice of heaven on earth, you know. And and that's yeah. the reality. But there are people, innocent people, being taken advantage of all around the world in in a way that is horrifying. If you really were to be able to witness it all. Um, and so we do pray for peace of Jerusalem. We pray for peace of God's people. 
Um, and we, we hope and pray that we always get a chance to do this next week, but we just want to say, I just want to say this. I want to say thank you to all of you who support us. You, you, without you guys, our ministry and now you see TV or FOJC could not do what we do. We, unlike a lot of other, uh, platforms out there, we don't get paid by Google. We don't get paid by YouTube. We don't get paid by Facebook. We don't get paid by Instagram. We don't get paid by any of these big corporations, everything that we get paid to do, we get paid uh, generated based off of what you guys are willing to do for us. So we're thankful for what you guys do to support us, even if that just means sharing our videos, hitting the like button, um, leaving a comment that's uplifting. I, I got the opportunity, and I love this. I just want to say this. I feel, I feel really just uh, the the need to say this. But I, I was eating out at, at a restaurant the other day, and uh, this happens. I would say fairly often. I'm sure it happens to David too, but somebody came up to me and they, they wanted, they just wanted to see me and they just started crying. And I was just so, I just couldn't believe it. And they, they apologized. And I was, and I, I was just saying, you don't have to apologize. You know, when, when, if you see us, me and David, we're out there, feel free to approach us unless you're going to approach us angrily, then, then maybe you shouldn't do that. But, uh, we, we, we're thankful for you guys as much as you guys are for us. I know, I know you people say that all the time, but we really do mean that. And we hope and pray that you guys have a great Passover, a uh, great time with your family. We're paying for pre peace for all of you. And um, that's really all I have to say, David. I'll, I'll leave it to you, and, and you can end us out. All right. Well, I, I just echo what John says to the greatest degree. We are, as you can tell by listening to the Midnight Ride, it's not a seminar on how to win friends and influence people. We give you the whole counsel of God and uh, – it's it's going to offend a lot of people. The truth yeah. will offend a lot of people. And that's all right, because the truth also will find a home. And we are so thankful for all of you who the Lord has joined your hearts with ours in this fight and in this call of God to get the truth out, not only of uh, what the Bible really says about Bible prophecy, but about the real gospel and about the real doctrine of Christ and the commandments of God, just bringing back and emphasizing, just believing in all the Bible, you know, and just telling people how great uh, that Old Testament is and how valid. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And like John says, we couldn't do it without you. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you so much for your prayers and support. And I'll just I'll, I'll just say that uh, we love you very much. Until next week, 10 p.m. Central. High five and good night, everybody from the Midnight Ride. Pound that like button. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.